Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Dana Goldman. I'm the dean of the Saul Price School of Public Policy. Uh, as you know, our school strives to educate and train leaders in public service, and I can't think of two more important examples than today's guests, USC President Carol Folt and Congresswoman Jane Harmon. Before we begin, I'd also like to, and, and by the way, we're testing out this virtual technology in our new conference room, and I, I, I want to thank the staff for the outstanding job so far. We'll see by the end whether that continues. Uh, but I'd also like to extend a special thank you to Rick Caruso, who's the chair of our Board of Trustees, for making this event possible and including uh, donating copies of Jane's book to the Price student community. And for those of you in the audience who haven't had an opportunity, please feel free to, free to take a copy on your way out today. Uh, we're grateful to Rick for his continued support of both the school and our university. Let me introduce um, someone who needs no introduction. Uh, Dr. Carol Folt is the 12th president of USC and holds the Robert C. Packard President's Chair. Her collaborative interdisciplinary approach is particularly resonant to those of us here at the Price School and for the students in the audience today. I know since her arrival, she's always put the students first, uh, which is in marked contrast to myself. And I know it's a joy for her to be in a room uh, today having these discussions. At USC, she's, she's a champion of excellence and innovation, and she's moving us forward at warp speed and access and affordability, sustainability, and building a culture of trust and accountability. She previously served as the chancellor of University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and prior to that began her career uh, as a university leader at Dartmouth, where she was both a dean, provost, and the acting president. She earned her bachelor's in aquatic biology and a master's in biology from UCSB, and her doctorate in ecology from the University of California, Davis. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Folt. It's great to be here. And joining us remotely uh, is our guest of honor, the Honorable Jane Harmon. Uh, for those of you who don't know, she's the former U.S. representative for California's 36th Congressional District, and she served from 1993 to 1999, and again from 2001 to 2011. In Congress, she represented the Aerospace Center of California, and she served on all major security committees, including six years on armed, armed services, eight years on intelligence, and eight on homeland security. After leaving Congress in 2011, she became president and CEO of the Wilson Center, a nonpartisan policy forum for tackling global issues through independent research and open debate, which, by the way, is something we're striving to do here at our school as well. Thanks to her long career in public service, Congresswoman Harmon has been recognized as a national expert at the nexus of security and public policy. And in her new book, which we're going to discuss today, entitled Insanity Defense, Why Our Failure to Confront Hard National Security Problems Makes Us Less Safe. It investigates three decades of national security mistakes and successes, and uh, as we'll learn today, gives us some recommendations for the future. Thank you for joining us, Congresswoman, and congratulations on your wonderful book. Can you hear me, by the way? Yes, I can. Excellent. <laughs> well, then, I want to get started right away by, you know, in your book, you tell a, a harrowing story, in my view. It spans four presidential administrations, and it chronicles our successes, as I noted, but also our national security failures. And I think, you know, as we're exiting the war in Afghanistan, this is a frequent example in your book. Um, the former uh, special envoy for Afghanistan and Pakistan, James Dobbins, and also former ambassador, uh, has talked a lot about the post-Cold War era as well. And in a theme that echoes in your book, he observed that nation building has become an international growth industry. <laughs> and perhaps contrary to popular impression, this has been successful. The world overall has become a less violent place over time, although the Middle East is a notable exception. 
In, in your book, you attribute this success to something you call the tools of soft power, which are often underfunded in favor of military force. I wonder if you could give us a perspective on that uh, at the outset. Well, I'd be delighted to, as soon as I say hello to the USC community. Um, <laughs> you left out a really important fact in the intro, which is that I'm a USC mom. My son, Dan, uh, graduated in 2004, and my late husband, Sidney Harmon, was a university professor uh, for a time, and his name is on the door, so far as I know, of the Sidney Harmon Academy for Polymathic Study. And uh, I have great affection for the place. And let me add two more things about USC in addition to um, something I want to say about both of you. One, uh, in the 90s, when I was first in Congress, my immediate neighbor in Marina del Rey was Rick Caruso. That is before he was the chairman of the board. And we have been friends for a very long time. And he has done a wonderful job, in my view, as chairman of the board. And I, I can't thank you enough, Rick, if you're listening in. Uh, for buying so many copies of my book. Very, very helpful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and um, the other point I'd like to make is that we all have mentors in life. And uh, it's especially important for women uh, of a certain age. Of course, that wouldn't include me. That must be my great grandmother uh, who uh, got our start in politics when there weren't a lot of women around. Well, my first mentor, my first mentor was a Trojan. And her name is Roz Wyman. Uh, she was called Roz Wiener when she graduated USC, and immediately after graduating, I have no idea what year that was, uh, she ran for, for LA City Council and was elected, the first woman elected to City Council. I was a kid. I truly was a very young kid, but there she was, the first woman elected, and she's still going strong in her 90s, and so guess what? USC is really uh, has really touched me, and now it has a superb president, Carol Folt. And I'm so happy to get to know you. And, uh, and Dana, uh, you too, my friend. I mean, the private school is a very important part of the school and obviously public policy is my passion. So now I'll answer your question about soft power. I didn't forget it, I didn't forget it. Uh, uh, soft, Joe Nye, who is a professor at Harvard, uh, and has had a, a number of senior jobs, has coined the terms soft power and hard power. It should be obvious, hard power is military power, soft power is everything else. And most military types would tell you war needs to be the last resort. We need to try everything else first. Uh, it's like Winston Churchill's uh, definition of democracy. It's, it's what you do when everything else has failed. And in this case, um, I, soft power has or had a really uh, big chance to succeed in Afghanistan after 9-11. And just what you said happened, which is mission creep. And the generals were there. We accomplished, we the U.S., with allies, let's not forget that, an international force accomplished the mission that Congress authorized after 9-11, which was to go after those who attacked us mostly in Afghanistan, and degrade their capacity to do it again. That was accomplished in 60 days. Well, 20 years later, we just left Afghanistan in kind of a mess. Uh, and we can discuss that too. But why did that happen? It happened because we didn't have a strategy for what would happen after the 60 days and Mission Creek happened. And the military footprint got bigger. And then uh, the military argued that we needed to stay because if we didn't stay, the place would be destabilized. And then, and then, then, and I document the specific ways in which I think, sadly, uh, we, we, we hurt America's chance of success there. And had we done it differently, had we used our soft power, diplomacy, uh, aid, foreign aid, um, uh, empowering uh, non-governmental organizations, NGOs, uh, using other government levers uh, to help the people of Afghanistan, I think we would be in a very different place now. Yeah, and I, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm going to invite the president to jump in at any time, but just to follow up on that point, 
you know, what you talked about NGOs and the role of peacekeeping is very important. It's actually one of the most cost effective means we have for ensuring safety in a post conflict society. But one of the other lessons I, I think you're hinting at is economic assistance. These tools of soft power are very important and vital here. And in a post uh, conflict society, when we leave and we take away the investment in the infrastructure, there's not a lot of evidence that uh, we can continue to sustain those gains. And so really you're talking about permanent, it's almost like education. You need to keep investing if you're gonna have a return. Well, on that point, the, our government funds something called the National Endowment for Democracy, NED. And it has two offshoots. One is called the National Democratic Institute, NDI, which is currently chaired by Madeleine Albright. And the other is called IRI, the International Republican Institute, which was uh, back in the day chaired by the legendary, amazing, and much missed John McCain. And the NDI and IRI worked together. And before I was elected to Congress, I went on a number of NDI missions to observe foreign elections in a variety of places. Uh, and most recently, the one I went on was in Ukraine in uh, 2014. Sadly, Ukraine has not turned out exactly as we hoped. There's still too much corruption. But my point is, what the U.S. government is investing in through the National Endowment for Democracy is building political capacity. And if you want governments to work to serve their own people, that's what you build. You don't build, you don't put your army in there and then train their army. Not, nothing wrong with doing that as part of a mission. But the main mission has to be for governments to be able to be competent and to overcome the instinct for kleptocracy and to uh, serve their citizens. Uh, and and that, that was a mission. It is a mission that the U.S. cares about. Yes. You know, this is so fascinating, and it makes me want to ask you a, a question about this, because this backing away from soft power I'm sure there's many reasons, and some of it are just internal politics pull you away from these longer term solutions. But many people have said that right now during a global pandemic, the, the US could be exercising soft power and that we may be really missing the chance to win the hearts and minds of people across the world um, in this, at this moment. And I wondered, have you thought, I'm sure you've thought about that. I mean, do you see this as a missed opportunity or are we, actually using our technology and advances to gain friends and help people? Well, that's a great example, Carol. And I would say we, we've had a slow start. It's not like we don't care, but we're great at logistics. Uh, we know how to do this in our sleep. And we have not even yet reached most of the world with these uh, amazing uh, new drugs, the mRNA technology, which is a U.S. technology, uh, is what is powering most of these vaccines that we're all getting. I hope everybody's vaccinated. Please be vaccinated and please get your kids vaccinated. My five-year-old grandson did it today in Los Angeles, just saying, go Charlie, and he was very brave. But my point is that getting those vaccines into arms around the world is something we are good at. There's been some issue about uh, whether we're going to require these firms uh, to either share their manufacturing secrets, I'm not sure that's a good idea, but certainly push out more manufacturing to the third world. We have to do that. The world is not going to be rid of this pandemic until the whole world is vaccinated or and or these uh, breakthrough pills that we're reading about are, are widely available. And, you know, unless we're going to put a, a, a gate around Africa and parts of Asia, uh, uh, very bad idea. Um, I, I, we will not, we will not make this work until we, uh, help everyone get vaccinated. And your point, Carol, is that's a good thing to do, uh, for foreign policy reasons. I mean, in two ways, uh, first of all, it builds world security, but second of all, generosity is one of our best traits in America and everybody wants to come here. Uh, it's, it's not like we've had a really well-functioning government lately, but they want to come to America because our generosity and the opportunity that uh, they can get by going to USC, pick, pick a school, USC, 
and and by uh, getting the the the, the uh, jobs that many from foreign countries are qualified to get uh, is is singular. It's not available anywhere else in the world. So if we want to build a better world and a better U.S. economy and a more secure world, uh, that's what we need to do: is show our generosity and show our our enormous skill at at dealing with something as vicious as this pandemic. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I, I want to talk about an issue that both of you as in your role as leaders have to deal with that you and, and it has to do with misinformation. And you mentioned vaccines. Uh, that's the most prominent example today. Um, but one of the things you talked about um, was after 9-11, uh, Congresswoman, a lot of inf we knew that the war in Afghanistan was important because that was the base for Al Qaeda. But then we also had the war in Iraq, and we learned later that uh, our policy advisors were getting poor quality information. And I think, uh, President Fult, you're dealing with issues of misinformation now of a different sort, which is, you know. Uh, uh, innuendo and stories that may or may not be true that are uh, going around the university and more broadly uh, about the campus. And I'd like to ask both of you, and maybe I'll start with you, President Fult. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think you really. You start with Jane. <laughs> no, no, I'm just, I haven't had to take But uh, how do we deal with, um, how, do we, how do we deal with this when in leadership positions? So asking me about misinformation and you know, I think we all know misinformation is a rising threat, whether it's here, whether it's what you're reading, uh, whether it's being generated by the algorithm of the social media that you look at. I mean, I think we have serious problems with the way we get information, the way we limit the information we get, the way you don't see opposing viewpoints, all of that are major issues that we face. And some of them were just bystanders to a media that produces it for us. So we've got lots of issues there. And I think a lot about misinformation. Some of it comes from, what is it they call it, the too long don't read culture. <laughs> But it's a serious one that I say to everybody because, I mean, I'm living in that right now. I'm sure you've all done it. Any of you in a student organization, anyone in a classroom, a, a faculty member, we produce so much information and people don't read it. Or if they read it, they forget it. So we all have to learn better ways to communicate, have many different ways in which we do it. And I think we have to be patient and realize if it's not read, that doesn't mean you stop doing it. I think one of the errors we make is to not stand up against misinformation. I think it's our responsibility to seek truth and no place better than a university. I don't think we're that good at holding each other responsible for paying attention to truth. And I've started to see things, I'm not saying here, but major moves across the country where people are saying, no facts, just acts. Don't, no fact, just act. That is terrifying to me. It's sort of antithetical to all I believe, even though I completely understand the idea that people want to stop talking and they want to start acting. But the idea that you throw out facts, and I get said this a lot, I'm sick of hearing facts. Well, we can't be sick of hearing facts. In fact, we want to engage everyone in the creation of facts and the true understanding that not all facts are interpreted in the same way. So there's a lot of room for discussion of facts and really probing them, learning how to debate, learning how to really, you know, what is, I'm a scientist. Science is always advancing by getting rid of things that were previously thought facts. So no fact is immutable. Well, maybe there are a few of them. I think there are a few laws of thermodynamics and a few other things that are that way. But we need to embrace the idea that we are communities that are designed to look at that, look at it critically, and be part of that conversation. So I think we have a responsibility not to shy away from trying to correct the record or at least be open to the conversation and holding people accountable, not only to get the information, but to be part of the discussion against misinformation. But I think that um, it plays out in a lot of ways. And one I want to say that's just very personal is I've been working on climate change for many years. I was part of the first uh, climate change symposium in America in the early 1990s. And I went back and I read 
the first article that I was a part, a co-author with many people on, I think it came out in about 1994. And we'd done, a, I'm pretty proud of that now in hindsight, <laughs> uh, looked at that, we'd used the simple models, long story, but we basically had made a series of predictions. And what we said was that summer warming, nighttime warming, we had some very clear patterns, and heat waves were going to be the source of the greatest destruction. Second to that would come subsequent effects on flooding, you know, all this stuff. We were right. That is exactly what's been shown. And 25 years later, why did so many, why were we unable to move the needle? Why were we willing to sort of let these things get thrown out over and over again for reasons that had nothing to do with the facts or the data or the long-term impact? And I think scientists working on climate change, policy members, humanists working on climate change often are asking themselves that now. The youthful generation that is coming in with a sense of urgency and anger maybe will be the next impetus to say we can't just stand still. When you see something that important, when you've been working on it for years, you have to fight back. And some of that is fighting back against misinformation or illogical, flawed debate. And so, you know, I'm still always optimistic because I look out at rooms like this and I think, well, that's where the change has to come. But it, we don't get it looking at Congress right now. So that, I think, is also difficult because we think policies made there. So we have to start thinking about the policies we can make where we live and then get those right and continue to contribute broadly. So yes. thank you. It's a really important issue. Yes. Jane? Well, I agree with every word of that. I absolutely do. I also think that universities are the place that has to get it right. Uh, it's, it's a little dicey, apparently, now with angry parents in, in, in secondary schools. But a university like USC has the right values and the right opportunity uh, to make sure that all viewpoints are heard and respected and communicated in a civil way. Uh, it also, I hope, makes up for the huge deficit that young people have understanding civics. I mean, that used to be taught in uh, secondary school. I remember my government teacher at Uni High in West Los Angeles, yes, I grew up in LA, uh, who was a fantastic uh, 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 role model for me. Uh, not as big as Roz Wyman, but, but big and who taught me things that I use and understand to this day. And we seem to have lost that. And I'm old enough to remember Walter Cronkite. He, you know, for most people probably was some dinosaur of another century, but he used to be on one of the evening broadcasts. And when it was over in half an hour, he said, and that's the way it is. <laughs> there was an authoritative figure who tried at least, I'm sure he got some things wrong because we're all fallible, to get it right, to tell the news straight. And now, you know, where is Walter Cronkite's great grandson or great granddaughter, better yet? Uh, I don't know, maybe she's Carol Fult. Uh, let's hope so. But, but so back to Iraq. Well, now, you're, thanks a lot, Dana. I really appreciate that question. Mm -hmm. um, don't throw tomatoes yet, let me explain. So we went into Afghanistan for the right reasons. Congress passed an authorization to use military force uh, and we did the right thing, and then we overstayed. That's my view of Afghanistan. And then I, if we want to go there, we can talk about the exit from Afghanistan this summer. Uh, I think it was morally right to end the military uh, action, but I think the way it, it worked out was uh, very troubling. And I still worry very much about the people still there, especially the women and girls. But let's move to, to Iraq. Uh, just shortly into our, our action against Afghanistan, I was in Congress and I started getting phone calls from some people in the uh, Bush 43 administration about, oh, you know, we, there's a real problem with Iraq. Um, you know, Saddam Hussein is dangerous. He's threatening the U.S. And it's very important for us to consider this mission also. The drumbeat got stronger. The arguments that were made, at least to me, were based on the fact, especially, that he had chemical weapons and the intention to use them and the capability to use them. Intelligence is based both on intentions and capabilities. So I was listening, of course I had to listen. And then came a national intelligence estimate that said, uh, these, these NIEs are very important. And there's a new one on climate, by the way, uh, Carol, that I think is important and will get some real attention. We had to fight to get climate to be considered a security issue. 
but it truly is. But anyway, so back to this, the NIE on Iraq, which I read, there's a declassified version that is open to the public, but then it has all the backup material. I read every word of it, you're supposed to read. So I read, and I traveled to various places that had intelligence agencies like uh, the UK that uh, corroborated the information in the NIE we had. That's the one Colin Powell used at the UN. Remember, he said that was his biggest mistake in his career. But anyway, so I read everything and it all pointed to the fact that Saddam Hussein had, this is you know widely known, chemical weapons and the ability to disperse them in the US and it, he was a real security risk. So I came home, this is in my book, and talked to former university professor, Sidney Harmon and said, Sidney, I've you know, done all this work in it. And I, I, I have concluded that I need to vote for this resolution, another authorization to use military force against Iraq. And he looked up, he was reading, he said, you're going to do what? And I said, I've read everything. I've been everywhere. Uh, I really believe this guy is a danger. And he said, uh, I think this is okay for a public audience. He said, that's a lot of crap. This is in the book. And I said, you don't know what you're talking about. You're a business mogul. What do you know about Iraq? And he said, you'll see. So uh, what happened? Speaking of misinformation, the information that I read was cherry picked and sorted through to present a case that wasn't a true case. And one of the biggest sources, uh, a guy named Curveball, wonderful name for, I, maybe it was a baseball player, but it was a German uh, whom the Germans had no uh, uh, respect for and told us, learned this later, uh, was giving fabricated information. The case for war was not there. And I've said repeatedly, I just said it at the Oxford Union, I was debating a couple weeks ago there, I said, the case was wrong and I was wrong. I was. And a lot of people like me who came to the conclusion the same way were also wrong. So we went to war in Iraq. And uh, I think everybody knows how that movie came out. And uh, it took our eye off Afghanistan. And oh, by the way, we didn't have the right strategy to pursue in Afghanistan anyway. It, 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 it opened up a huge vacuum for Iran to fill. And we ended up with two major endless wars and less stability. And it was just uh, really catastrophic. And I was there and it was a big mistake. Um, what happened after that was not a mistake, just, just to reclaim my, my, my shredded uh, reputation here. Uh, a number of us on a bipartisan basis decided we needed to reform how these NIEs are done and reform our intelligence community to connect the dots because we'd had two major failures. One was 9-11 and the other one was Iraq. And so we created the Director of National Intelligence, this new major office, it, to be a coordinator across 16 intelligence agencies. And that law was enacted in 2004. It's a long story. It was pretty contentious, um, but we got it done. And the DNI adds a lot of value. And the current crowd is very good. And the DNI, for the first time, happens to be a woman. Uh, and I just am very impressed with uh, how that reform is working. So I got one wrong, got one right. You know, that's what happens here. I do want to come back to uh, the points both of you made about uh, dealing with misinformation because, Carol, you said facts are facts, and I, I because you mentioned polymath uh, and Sydney, I did want to point out that a lot of us thought for a long time that Newtonian physics was right, but it turns out when science progresses, you learn that it's a much more nuanced story. And I would argue actually that Congress and the success of the United States as a democracy has always been because it's a deliber deliberative body that engages in robust debate before it makes a decision. And often our failures are related to when we act quickly and rashly in response. And I would say the same thing is true of universities where we're devoted to science and even in questions where we wanna understand what the right action is, we need to take a deliberative view and we can't just act out rashly. With that as a preamble, I wanna to talk to both of you about this balance between civil liberties um, and freedom of speech uh, and security. 
And, you know, this comes up in the context of 9-11 as well, because we didn't know if there were going to be more terrorist attacks, and we quickly passed laws that changed the nature of information. We had memos coming out about uh, engaging, uh, it, it turns out, potentially violating the Geneva Convention to extract information from combatants who may or may not have been uh, prisoners of war, depending on your legal view. And we had the Patriot Act, and we, we ended up having to correct from that over the course of the next few decades. And I want to uh, ask you, Jane, could you talk a little bit about that correction? That uh, yes, that this, is, this is a depressing story. So everybody get ready, buckle up. My so so after 9-11, after uh, well, on 9-11, I was there. I was walking toward the dome of the U.S. Capitol, which everybody thinks was the intended target of the fourth plane that went down in Pennsylvania because of the bravery of its passengers. Uh, and that plane was late. Had that plane taken off on time, we might not have been aware, and it might actually have hit the dome of the Capitol, and it might have incapacitated Congress in terms of its function because there were so many phys people physically at risk. I know some might think that would be a good thing, but more seriously. That would have been a catastrophe for our form of government. But at any rate, I was walking there. Uh, my office called and said the Capitol just closed, uh, which I thought was a horror since we all take an oath to provide for the common defense and I didn't think it should have closed. But at any rate, it was a day of milling around. There was no evacuation plan. And finally, uh, late in the afternoon, uh, those of us who were there, several hundred members stood on the steps of the Capitol, which had reopened held hands and sang, God bless America. Now, why am I telling this story? I didn't look at the, I don't even know who was standing next to me. And I didn't care if that person was a Democrat or a Republican. And everybody felt the same way. America was under attack. America was under attack. Nobody was finger pointing. And the other part of it was the, most of the world came to our, uh, our, our aid or offered to. Uh, NATO invoked Article 5, the Common Defense Provision, uh, of the NATO treaty for the first and only time in its history without being asked by us. Iran offered to help. Iran had nothing to do with 9-11 and it's an enemy of Al Qaeda and ISIS in case that misinformation is still around. Cuba offered us airspace because we closed our airspace because of the planes. And we missed the opportunity to pull America together and to pull the world together. It's just a, a, a tragedy. So afterwards, what happened was um, a group of people in the Bush 43 administration led by Vice President Dick Cheney, who ironically had been a member of Congress and uh, Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld and some people in the Office of Legal Counsel in the Justice Department decided that America could be attacked again. I agree with that. But that a series of steps had to be taken without consulting Congress. This is my defense of Congress, at least for that moment. And a lot of the things that happened, the formation of Guantanamo Bay prison, the, the adoption of interrogation and defense and, and, and detention procedures otherwise that violate the Geneva Conventions and our laws against our laws then against torture. And uh, a, a number of other things that we could list and go into happened then. Finally, Congress Got, was able to get back in the act, and we uh, changed, uh, we, we passed a law, a new law uh, defining torture in a way that prevented uh, the, these enhanced interrogation techniques, which had been adopted. Um, we didn't do anything about Guantanamo prison, but the Supreme Court did and declared that the people detained there were in U.S., on U.S. Uh, territory and were entitled to lawyers and trials and so forth. And that's a still an ongoing thing. Joe Biden is trying to get most of the people out. We're, we're below 40 prisoners where we had hundreds before. Um, but it was a huge mistake to put that prison there. And, and we're correcting it on the surveillance laws. You just asked about this. Uh, Congress got back in the act, amended the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and tried and has tried to uh, curtail, um, you know, rogue surveillance practices, which were happening. And, and just to your point, though, Dana, about um, uh, privacy and uh, liberty and security, I don't think 
we should talk about that as a balance. It's not a zero sum game. I think we need more of both or we're going to get less of both. And it was Ben Franklin, who's even older than I am, who said he that that gives up liberty for security uh, deserves neither. So I think this is a very tricky subject. And I think USC should devote a lot of brain cells to helping get this right for the future. And uh, so, uh, by the way, uh, when I was teaching, I'm not teaching this semester, but I was accused of enhanced interrogation techniques. And I want to point out that's different than what the ones that Jane is talking about. But <laughs> no water. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but you face this, uh, President Fult, on campus where you have to balance freedom of speech against security and uh, how do you, can you talk a little bit about how you make these trade-offs? Yeah, I think it's a more complicated um, than a simple balancing against. I think you, you don't have to give up one to have the other, or you can't really give up one to have the other. You have to do both. But I do want to make one correction. I, I was saying facts are facts, but they also are subject debate because facts change. Right. I mean, that's exactly what I think a university needs to do. Um, as, and we need to create those forms, which this is, you're all a part of it. And there's so many places at SC where you can do that. So maybe we'll come back and talk about that in a bit. You know, I do think um, universities need to hold to free speech. We need to be the supporters of that. We need to live it. And I think the lack of civics education has been something that has really started to have an effect on people. I'm uh, in a group called the AAU, which is the 65 leading universities in America. And our whole last meeting was, how do we support democracy at universities? And I was one of the keynote speakers. And another uh, came from, from Johns Hopkins and Purdue, where they have actually introduced a requirement for civi civics learning. Because they feel that it has been really a loss that in spite of our thinking people know it. Many students don't really even understand what due process is, what free speech means, you know, what are the laws that actually are at the heart of our democracy. So we probably could do more education. And I think that is where education is supposed to be our sweet spot. So let's keep going back to the idea that when we have things like free speech, we talk about it with its legal limits, but we don't focus on that as a legalistic thing. We think about the ideal that it represents. We work with people about what would it mean? You know, we've looked down the road at various societies when freedom of speech has been taken away, when due process doesn't exist, and it is very ugly. It is not a future we want. So how do we instead turn that conversation to help people really understand it, help build it, and work on a community where free speech and belonging and safety can coexist? You know, and I think that's what we need to do. We need to do it better. We need to know that some aspects of free speech get very much in the disruption of people's lives. And first of all, I think we need to understand students are capable of supporting and being around things that make them uncomfortable. But we need to talk about it, to have an understanding of when does it cross a line that it's poor teaching. Well, it still might be protected. You know, so I think we think about it in that way, but we should return back to the idea that when it's not just thrust at people, but it's discussed with people, when it's a part of the conversation and the debate, rather than just a set of laws that says, we have to do it this way, that's the law, that won't ever buy into the why that exists in our society anyway. And so I think there's... Um, a lot of work to be done there, but every time I see it be successful, it's usually when you bring everybody into the conversation. Now, I think at SC, I've seen a lot of debate. Um, one of the first events I attended when I was brand new um, president was I was invited to a student-run group that was debating abortion rights. Now, I've been places where you couldn't have a calm conversation debating abortion rights. And I went into that room and I was blown away with the civility. There were very passionate opinions, but the students set the rules for what a good discourse would be. It was very um, robust conversation. And I went away going, wow, I haven't seen that on a campus before. And I began to understand some of that comes from, I think, programs like PPL, PPE, the Center for Public Discourse, what happens here in the Price School. The more I learn, the more I know that there are actually a lot of points within this university where debate is actually what people do. And people, surprise, surprise, argue both sides. So if we can start extending 
kind of the real learning and the capacity of that to bring it back to bear when we get to the really important personal times that becomes important. I think we can do it really well. So we're in the right place to do it. We've got great people that want to do it. We certainly don't succeed. And in the end, I have to follow the law, even if things aren't um, what I would ever want to see. But I hate to ever have that be the main reason that you do it. You know, I think it's really important that it goes beyond that. And we recognize that even things that are legal can hurt people. And, and we find ways to really uh, combat it um, in different ways and with different type of conversation. So again, I, we have a great, we should be the place people test that and learn it and challenge it because it gets a lot harder when you're no longer at a university. And it is contested space, but it's a lot better here than other places I've seen to the extent that people mostly seem willing to get into those debates. And so that always gives me uh, a real sense of hope and, and confidence that we can improve it here. Oh, and this school much. actually is a really big part of it. They do it in Annenberg. They do it actually in many places on, in Dornsife. You know, when I start looking around, I'm seeing pockets of that that are really exciting. That's great. And that's very well said. Uh, Jane, did you have it? We're going to get to, I, what, before I, uh, I give you an opportunity, for those of you in the audience, we're going to start our Q&A portion. If you'd like to ask a question, please come up to the microphone here. Um, and uh, I also have some that are coming in online. But Jane, did you want to respond to that? Well, I agree with that, uh, except for one little piece, and that is we have to follow the law. Yes, we have to follow the law, but we can also change the law. But that's what Congress is supposed right. to do. It's supposed to make the laws for the United States, and then the executive branch executes the laws, and the and the court system, the federal court system, decides if what, what's going on is consistent with our Constitution. Well, in case anyone missed it, Congress hasn't been extremely productive lately. I thought the passage of the infrastructure bill on a bipartisan basis was wonderful. And I know uh, some friends of mine who happen to be Republicans were at the signing ceremony. They, they didn't crowd around the president, but they were there and they showed up and braved them. Uh, and I think it is disgraceful that people who are voting for something that is extremely popular in America, including in their districts, are getting punished by their own party uh, for doing that. I mean, we have traded toxic uh, partisanship for toxic tribalism, and both parties are, are in the midst of that. Both parties have wings that attack the other part of the, of the party. And who loses? We all do. So what would I wish for, just put that out there, is that um, the, this generation of USC students like Roz Wyman get into politics, either party, and be there for a reason, to put the country first. And if you actually do that, and you realize that none of us has a monopoly on wisdom, and that the hard problems require us to come together and wrestle with the hardest problems, uh, then guess what? We can make better laws. And then Carol will say, I'm happy to follow the law because it's such a good law. Oh, Jane, one quick thing I want to say, because I love that you said that. My speech, my part of that AAU conversation was not what I talked about. I talked all about getting out the vote. And I actually had brought forward a lot of examples of the Price uh, group that is all focused on getting out the vote. And I talked about being and running for government and getting involved at local politics and state levels because mm -hmm. most universities go right out to federal level, but we have so much that we can do at the local and at the state level. So you'd be happy. I was actually talking about that too and, and I, some of those here because I think I would, you're so right. I, I would be happy because I think the local... <laughs> State levels are less partisan, at least at the moment, I don't mean they're not partisan, than Congress is. And a lot more can happen at the, at the local level. And you mentioned climate. A lot of good stuff is happening at the local and state level, even if it's not happening or not happening enough at the federal or international level. Let's remember we just concluded COP26, this International Climate Conference. And I'm, I'm a bit disappointed. We didn't set hard goals for the world, and we don't have enforcement standards. I mean, it was better that more countries recognized the problem, uh, but it is, there's a long way to go. OK, I'd like to get to some of the questions from the audience. Um, I'll start with a question from Amy Ross. Um, 
Congressman Harmon, uh, in your book, you talk about the proposed initiative in early 2001 to establish an, a Los Angeles-based counterterrorism center. Um, mm -hmm. Given the geopolitical climate today, do you think that is an idea that should be revisited? And I should point out that Adam Rose, the former director of CREATE, is here, and is, we've done a lot of work on this uh, here at yeah. USC. Well, I mentioned CREATE. CREATE is a Homeland Security Center of Excellence based where? At USC. And uh, we had to, uh, remember, on 9-11, there was a massive intelligence failure, and the part of the failure was connected with dots. And there literally was information in the FBI that some of the, the what turned out to be the hijackers were living with an FBI informant in San Diego. This is going to make you break out in hives. And somehow that information never got to anybody. Uh, shame on us all. So there's been a major effort to do horizontal information sharing across the federal government, but also vertical information sharing from the national government to the state and local governments. And that's what this counterterrorism idea, center idea is. And a lot of progress has been made in LA uh, about it. And, you know, LAX was once the intended target of, an, of a terrorist attack. Let's not forget that. The ports of LA and Long Beach are the largest container ports in America. And if they could only unload the cargo, oops, that's, that's a different problem. Um, some of that cargo could potentially be very dangerous. And we, we set up these magnetometers to, to uh, screen the cargo. We passed something called the Safe Ports Act to make sure that uh, all the cargo was checked at the point of embarkation and that it couldn't be tampered with on the high seas. I mean, a lot of progress was made um, and a lot of it was LA based. Maybe because LA uh, certainly has a lot of uh, uh, very productive members of Congress. Just, well, it doesn't make. Yeah, I mean, you're 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 absolutely right, and it doesn't make headlines when there isn't a terrorist attack in right. Los Angeles. But the fact that we've been safe for so long, you know, there there's a lot of credit that needs to be shared, and I think you and the people who work in that center deserve. Uh, certainly some of it. Um, one of the questions, another question from Randall Ushiyama is, and this gets to this point about civics that you were making, uh, President Folt. Do you have a sense that, do you think a stronger sense of civic duty would have made a difference with regard to vaccination policy? And I think it also means uh, willingness to engage in getting vaccinated. I do. I mean, I think we lost surprisingly lost the entire aspect of public health and what does a society do to protect public health in all of this because it went down other roads, became po extremely politicized. And so the effectiveness of the vaccine, the true miracle actually that was the production, the production of those vaccines, the miracle that came from 30 years of US policy to do basic research, all of that got lost. But I think also got lost even the civics that led to things like the polio vaccine and all sorts of other vaccines that people were taking and for years were really increasing the health of the country. So I think, yes, had we had a different start to the conversation, and a different sense about why this was being done, and maybe a different sense about how it was implemented. I'm not saying that wasn't a bit clutch-fisted, too. I think you could have had a very different outcome. Well, I think one of the things we did right here at USC is if you look at the signage, it was a, not about protecting, it was about protecting the community. Yep. That's why we wash our hands. It's not just to protect ourselves, it's to protect others, and the notion that somehow that is violating someone's personal liberty has really skewed this whole perspective. I mean, uh, you know, we, we do a lot of things uh, for the benefit of others. So. Well, like, a, lot of, a lot of laws about air and water and all of these things come back to similar mm -hmm. sorts of arguments. But I want to say the signage was designed by USC students. Yeah. At I mean, I'm just going to say that beautiful, wonderful message and signage came from students. It's usually a good place to, to start. That's exactly right. Um, for both of you, an anonymous question. Um, uh, a lack of bipartisanship can result in slow progress, and we're up against the clock when it comes to climate change. 
What can we do to push it through without violating our democratic principles? Uh, Jane, maybe we'll start with you because this is a theme in your book more generally. Well, my, my last chapter is entitled The Incredible Shrinking Congress. And I despair about the toxic tribalism in Congress and in the country. I mean, Congress, to some extent, is reflective of the country, although I think the way we draw district lines uh, encourages uh, partisanship, unfortunately, except in California, where we have citizen commissions and, and so-called jungle primaries. But in most states, uh, governors of one party can determine what the, the congressional delegation looks like. And what's wrong with that picture is it just locks in partisanship. And if uh, and I hope this won't happen if the the state laws, not in California, but the 19 states are proposing to adopt, and some of them have adopted these laws that will restrict opportunities to vote, uh, stay in effect. If Congress can't override that by a national voting law, which I hope it can, uh, we may end up with a situation where uh, partisan legislatures, again, gerrymandered by their governors, and this is not just Republicans, but uh, this, these laws are designed, I think, in most part to help, uh, not really Republicans, but to help Trump supporters. If, if they can override the vote of the people, I think we are truly doomed. So what can we do about bipartisanship? Uh, we can only do it by inches right now. And I do celebrate the passage of the infrastructure bill, the so-called hard infrastructure bill. Uh, uh, last week and the sign signing of it um, Monday by uh, President Biden. Excellent. Uh, anything to add? Yeah, no, I'd love to answer that one a little bit about, I'm going to talk about it with respect to climate change and sustainability because mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think we could all say that we're disappointed where COP26 went and we could also say there was amazing stuff that came out of it. Some of the most amazing were the things that people said, the voices that were being heard for the first time. You know, you've got to find the, the good along with that. But I think we have a very, we can start, you can always start working locally. So within a university, we can do every single thing. We can walk the walk. If we walk the walk, we start having a big influence just on the way we manage our own environment, our own operations. If we walk the walk and we make it our job then to walk the walk with our community, use our resources to get out into our neighborhoods and work with them. We start having a very fast and a very large uh, immediate effect. I looked up this number. There are actually 5,300 universities in America and they live in all those communities. If every one of them started taking actual actions that really did reduce our carbon footprint, created better transportation, gave incentives to people to do things in a different way that we think actually could be pretty well uh, accepted because they would improve the quality of life and air, we have a big impact. There's 20 million students at universities in America if every one of those students knew just one more thing about sustainable environment, had just one way that what they did could have an influence, you suddenly have 40 million people working on it. And pretty soon, it's 160 million. So where we can act locally, we can actually have an outside impact. So I think when you have that kind of fragmentation, you just have to find a different way to do it. And for us, you do these other things too, vote, you get out, you're activists, but you can do so much right here. And I've begun to see the real power of that here. Um, just in the recent couple of years since we have our amazing President's Task Force on sustainability and Daz Mas Dan Masmanian is here who's been just helping lead that with our students and our faculty, we've made amazing changes here. And I think we're going to get to the point, I'm just going to say it, where we're going to be able to say that we'll be carbon neutral with respect to electricity by 2025. We already wow. got the divestment out of the, um, the endowment. We have massive changes in operations and the greening of the buildings. I mean, these start having a pretty big influence, especially in the community, because we're already out working to bring water, clean water, clean shade, and low waste into the local neighborhood. So, you know, I just think you can't get too depressed by the bipartisanship because you realize in this particular case, one person can easily become four people and you start building 
an army of people working towards sustainability. And so that's where I go away from just pulling my hair at things that might not happen at the federal level yet and think, well, we can sure do it here. And uh, I think that's, that's a way to go. If I would just add, I have solar panels on my roof and my house in, on Venice Beach. I drive an electric car and I recycle. That's not enough, there we but go. It, and at least it's I, something. I think with that, we'll leave it there. I want to thank <laughs> you both. Uh, President Fulton, Congresswoman Harmon, and thank you all for coming, and there Thanks are lunches outside. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane. Bye. Great to meet you.